the Arctic Ocean is warming up very quickly, up to perhaps four times faster than anywhere else on the planet. But the problem is that there's nobody there studying it for most of the year. The Tara Polar Station will shelter scientists and allow scientists to, to observe what is happening through the seasons over multiple years to really follow how the ecosystem in the Arctic is changing as a consequence of climate change. The Tara Polar Station, as you see, has a very particular design for a ship, but it's principally designed to be on the ice in the central Arctic. Because the whole ice pack in the Arctic rotates very, very, very slowly, we will basically maneuver this ship into the ice, and then it will be the ice that will transport it over what we call a transpolar drift. This is uh, unique, really. Tower Polar Station is unique in its shapes. That's why it's also very exciting to um, do this trip because we have no, uh, no reference. What makes the Tower Polar Station adapted for the temperature of both cold and the drift in the Arctic? It's first of all this shape, which is like uh, an egg or the oval uh, structure, and that allows the ship to be bound in the ice without to uh, be smashed or crushed in the sea ice. Why? Because this curvy shape um, makes the hull pops out onto the ice. So basically, she will avoid the ice pressure. And then uh, the well insulations and all the fact that we can de-ice and hit uh, the whole station. In fact, it's like an observatory designed for cold temperature uh, at the, the maximum or the minimum. It's below zero, it's minus 52 Celsius degrees. Most people don't really think about ice as being a place where organisms live, right? We think about soil, we think on land, we think water. You know, we have a good idea of how life is adapted to these different ecosystems. But life in ice, you know, we know very little about this. And yet is this life in sea ice, which is incredibly important for the entire ecosystem. But we're interested to study um, everything really from what is happening in the atmosphere, through the layer of sea ice into the water column below. In order to be able to do that, we have all kinds of equipment on the top of the vessel to measure what is happening in the atmosphere. We'll launch kites, uh, tethered balloons, which will be able to measure what is happening in the atmosphere. We will be able to go outside the vessel and do generate cores of ice, um, which we can then analyze inside. And then in particular, Inside the vessel, where we have the laboratories, uh, we have what is called a moon pool, which is basically an open hole in the vessel through which we can deploy scientific equipment. Um, and that is really the key that allows us to studying what is happening underneath the sea ice, which otherwise you know, remains kind of invisible to us. We don't know precisely how long this transpolar drift will take because actually it's only been done three times in all of history. The first time was Nansen on the Fram in the 1890s who did a first transpolar drift. He took more than three years to go from one side to the other. The Tara sailing ship did the second transpolar drift in 2006, it took one year and four months. And then there was a third expedition on the German icebreaker Polarstern uh, from 2019 2020. It again took less than a year. The transpolar drift is getting faster and faster because the ice is thinner and so it's moving faster over the Arctic Ocean. So we anticipate that each transpolar drift will last around 500 days, something like that, so a year and a half. So in fact the, 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 the ship has full autonomy for 500 days in terms of fuel, in terms of food, in terms of science. Um, so that is more or less what we're planning for. Our polar station is clearly designed to be in the Arctic in a very low tight temperature for human beings. We have a different way to produce the heat. Generators, boilers, uh, battery park. It's powered with a small engine because uh, the aim is really to be ice bound. So it's, 
she needs to be autonomous on the way from Brittany to the the place where she's going to be iceborne. So it's uh, an engine uh, about 336 uh, kilowatts, which is not much. And uh, then she had two uh, generators to produce all the power needed on board to make some science and to live aboard, basically. We have uh, LFP, which is lithium battery also, to do zero emissions. And we have, of course, some emergency generators in case of there is a break, blackout, breakdown in, in one of the engines. Being on board the power station while uh, the drift is, I mean, so far it looks very well. It's, it's like a small chalet, small cabin in the yeah, in the Alps. So it's exciting. We'll see. During the long polar night of winter, you know, where there is darkness for five, six months of the year. It can be cold, you know, minus 30, minus 40, uh, storms and so on. On Tower Polar Station, there are 12 cabins on board, so there'll be 12 people on board, sailors, journalists, six scientists on board during the winter months. The sort of selection process that we're going to follow is very much similar to, to uh, how astronauts are selected, you know, to go up to the International Space Station. Uh, it's also the sort of selection procedures that, that are followed for scientists going to the bases in, in Antarctica. Those scientists have to fulfill multiple prerequisites. Um, they have to be psychologically uh, very stable, obviously. Uh, they have to be very good at teamwork. Um, they have to be good scientists to understand you know, when something is interesting hap is happening that they'll be able to follow up you know, from a scientific perspective. Uh, but they also have to be sort of good engineers. All of the models, our climate models, project that summer sea ice uh, will disappear at the North Pole, perhaps even 20 years' time. So many organisms live inside the sea ice. Perennial, multi-year sea ice has a very different structure to annual sea ice. The whole ecosystem may well change. Studying the biology of these organisms, how do they survive, what are their metabolisms like, uh, how do they change metabolisms through the seasons, what sort of capacity do they have to prevent formation of ice inside them. We want to understand more about these cryoprotectants, uh, how they work in Arctic sea ice. And these kinds of things can also have applications, you can imagine, in to be able to preserve organisms uh, for long periods of time, maybe to help us prepare for space travel for several years at a time. Understanding more about how life goes to sleep and then can be woken up again. That is crucial information. 